Today we are interviewing Professor Oliver Hart, the winner of the Swergis Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel in 2016. Professor Hart currently teaches at Harvard University as the Andrew E. Furer Professor of Economics. It's a great honor and a privilege to be speaking with you today, and we are extremely thrilled to have you. My name is Sarish Chasti, and I'm a rising junior at Homedale High School, and I'm the founder of Company Roots. My name is Raul Kaburu. I'm a rising freshman at St. Paul School and the vice president at Company Roots. Before the interview, we just want to thank you so much for taking your time. It's such an honor and a privilege to be meeting with you. Um, the first question that we'd like to ask you today is, what were your roots and how did they help you get to be the man you are today? Uh, my roots. Well, I was born in London. I am British, uh, and I spent uh, the first um, 23 years of my life in, in Britain. I, I uh, went to school in London um, and uh, to a place called University College School uh, near where I lived, which is North London. Mm -hmm the Hampstead area, and then I um, went to Cambridge University where I studied mathematics. So I, uh, at that point, um, I, I liked mathematics a lot, and I sort of thought maybe I would become a mathematician. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, it quickly became clear that there were many people far more talented in mathematics than I was. <laughs> and so, um, so I actually, I didn't work that hard at Cambridge, but, uh, um, you know, when I graduated, um, I had to decide what to do. Uh, it was 1969. I didn't want to, you know, it wasn't a moment. It was a sort of radical period. Um, the business world did not appeal to me. And so I was looking around for, for something to do further studies in. Mm -hmm. And I was told that economics was a good area because mathematics was being applied. And I was curious about economics anyway. I felt it was important. I didn't know anything about it. Right. And so I went to Warwick University, um, which is in England, uh, in Britain, and I did uh, a two-year um, master's degree there. The first year being catching up with economics because I knew nothing, and then right. the second year being the master's degree. And then um, I went to Princeton for a PhD because then, as now, um, the best PhD programs in economics are in the United States. Right. Um, and so um, at that point, I sort of started, uh, I suppose, becoming myself. Uh, I mean, as a, <laughs> I mean, I, um, uh, in every way, I met my future wife there, but I also um, discovered something called uh, mathematical economics and economic theory. And that attracted me, and uh, I started working on that. But over time, my interests have changed quite a bit right. from um, being, um, you know, fairly, uh, doing something called general equilibrium theory. I don't know how much economics you've been exposed to, but there's this area called general equilibrium theory, which is mm -hmm. quite mathematical, where you try to put all the pieces of the economy together. Um, and, and, and look at the equilibrium outcome and sort of what it, properties it has. Um, and so I, I spent some time on that, but over time I uh, became more interested in understanding, if you like, better at a smaller level what's going on when we're talking about um, two individuals um, interacting through a contract. Yeah. Eventually, I eventually uh, decided that contract theory, what, what has become known as contract theory was interesting, how um, it doesn't have to be two, it could be a group of individuals design their economic relationship to be as efficient as possible. And that also along the way led me to become interested in law because lawyers are also, also study that kind of thing. Right. Um, next year in my high school, I'm taking uh, AP macro and microeconomics. I'm not sure if you know what those are. Uh, sorry, uh, what the yeah. courses. Um, yeah. So I definitely I'm following that type of path as well. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um. So what was your childhood like? And like I know you were interested in the field of mathematics. So how yeah. did you continue to specialize in it? Like past um, Cambridge and War uh, War like work. I think you said. Yeah. How did I? How did I specialize in what mathematics? Yeah. Did you well, Did you go from mathematics to economics, or did you continue yeah. to 
kind of go for the pure mathematics? I, in school, uh, economics was barely offered. I had no interest okay. in it, and I think I think there may have been a little bit, but at my school, but it was not. Um, very little at that time. I'm, right. I'm sure it's different now because economics has become more, um, ex you know, it's, it's, it's regarded as more important now. Right. It was then, this was the 60s, mid to late 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I did at school, uh, you know, you had to choose basically a science track or a humanities track. Mm -hmm. And I chose science. And so I specialized after, um, well, yes, actually, the age of, um, I think, 15, I specialized, or even 14, 14 or 15, I specialized uh, in things like physics, chemistry, and mathematics. Yeah. And um, I didn't like physics and chemistry very much, but I did like mathematics a lot. And um, then I went, you know, at Cambridge, the way it works, so this maybe you didn't, ah, I, I see perhaps... Um, this is where there's a little cultural divide because in England, um, it was then and it's still the case that at a place like Cambridge, you choose one, uh, typically one subject like mathematics. I did that for three years. Yeah. So I got my BA in mathematics. I studied nothing else for three years, uh, <laughs> which was both positive and quite negative. Yeah. Uh, particularly, there, were, there was a lot of mathematics I really didn't want to be doing like um, the, you know, fluid mechanics and mechanical engineering and solving lots of differential equations. I wasn't very interested in that, mm -hmm. but I was forced to do it. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not like a liberal arts education here where you do a bit of uh, quite a few things. So that's why when I emerged at the age of 21 from Cambridge University, um, I knew a, a, a reasonable amount of mathematics. Uh, at least I knew how to think mathematics. I knew how to prove things and this kind of thing. But I didn't, and I had, I remembered a little, I suppose, a bit of physics and chemistry from school. Um, but that was about it. I didn't know how to write. I was a terrible writer at the time. Yeah. And I had to, as I then moved, so moving to economics was a big change. But that's what I did at Warwick. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as I say, over... I was initially attracted to the more mathematical branches of economics, and that continued at Princeton. But then over time, I would say I've sort of moved. I'm still an economic theorist, but the mathematics I use now, the kind of work I do in contract theory, is not very math intensive. I think it's conceptually intensive. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful to have a mathematics background so that you're not constrained. But actually, most of the work is trying to figure out what the right assumptions to make yeah. are. Yeah, and how do you train yourself to make yourself like know uh, what paths to take when you're looking at these assumptions? Uh, it's something which, uh, it's very hard to, <laughs> I would say it, the passage of time, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't do the now, what, what I do now I couldn't have done starting out. It's yeah. years uh, of work uh, of, 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 you know, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing. Um, you know, it's like, um, I don't know, you're a tennis player. You learn to be a good tennis player by playing tennis. Yeah. <laughs> play tennis, so. You learn some tricks, no doubt, along the way, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, some new shots, some, or also, you know, what works, what doesn't work in what situation. I mean, I happen to like watching tennis, so I mentioned that, but. Yeah. Um, Wimbledon's on now. Yeah. Are you watching Wimbledon right now? Uh, I have been, yeah. Yeah. To, uh, Federer lost yesterday. That stuff. I know. I know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, but I, I, I watched uh, even this morning. I watched uh, Kerber against Osipenko. Uh, Osipenko. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I watched that. Then I had to leave. But I see that uh, Serena won. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you said you were interested in law, and you played like a crucial role in Black and Decker versus um, USA and Wells Fargo versus USA. So, um, like, can you please explain, like, what, like, what, what like, you did what, there? Yeah, like, how big of a role you played in those two cases? Sure. Also, um, um, yeah. could you, by any chance, just move your camera uh, down a little so we could see your face a little more? Or yeah, that better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, it. I think uh, it just maybe shifted or something. 
Okay, but it may be with the way I'm sitting. I slouch. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, um, let, let me say that um, over time, so um, I, uh, I was interested in contract theory, which is, is really, as I say, studying, it's related to a field called mechanism design in economics, but it's about, it's really saying, you know, you have uh, some people who are going to work together and um, they want to incent make sure that they all work hard and work in the right direction and collaborate, co cooperate and are not opportunistic, yeah. uh, not too self-interested, all this kind of thing. Uh, um, don't break their promises. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the question is how to design it. And um, uh, at some point I realized with, uh, with co-authors that um, um, one of the big challenges in reality, this is something lawyers understood very well, but economists much less so, um, is that actually when you write a contract, it's very hard to anticipate all the things that are going to happen if, yeah. it's, if it's a relationship of any complexity. You know, if it's going to last for um, several years, then things can happen which um, you, you didn't really anticipate and, and, and you didn't, and it's very hard to plan for those things. So that um, I, I use the word incomplete, contracts are incomplete. And um, what I did, what I did that was uh, perhaps a little new relative to what was out there already was to stress, to point out that in a world, if we have a, um, if you and I, the three of us have a contract which is incomplete, so there's stuff missing from it, mm -hmm. then um, a key question is who has the right to decide on things when the contract is silent about them? Yeah, and uh, I call this residual control rights. Okay. And um, these residual control rights often go with asset ownership. So, to give you an example, um, you know, you take your school um, mm -hmm. and uh, imagine that um, uh, I don't know. Well, maybe it's sometimes used. Some of the rooms are sometimes used uh, by outsiders. Yeah. You know, whether they are they might rent them out sometimes let's say in the summer conceivably you know i want to have a, a conference there and i i call up the school and they say sure you can use the hall um and this is how much um you'll have to pay okay so that's a contract now suppose um it turns out that when i'm as we get closer to the conference i in order for, uh, you know i want to have a particular performance there or something and i would like to have certain lights or i would like to perhaps um change something about the the, the hall okay. yeah so i i would have to go to the school i wouldn't be able to just do that yeah um unless the contract said i could do it um i would have to get permission from the school because it's their hall they own the hall. So that's an example. They have the residual control rights. This would be something by assumption. It wasn't specified in the contract that I want. Maybe I need to paint. I'm, I'm, being, I'm not very good at thinking of real examples. But, you know, imagine I wanted to paint one of the walls white. Yeah. Um, because that's the way the performance would, would look good. Um, I may, if I thought of it, we could have agreed in the contract that I am allowed to do that and I yeah. have to pay extra for that and all that. And then there wouldn't be a dispute about it. But to the extent that we didn't think of it and now comes up, uh, the owner of the hall, which is the school, um, they have a veto on that. Mm -hmm. And so I would have, we'd have to negotiate. Okay. Yeah. So that's an example. So I've, I've stressed the importance of this idea of a residual control right and also the allocation of them. Um, now, all right, this brings us to these legal cases. So um, these legal cases both involved, um, they involve roughly the same thing. So in the case of Black & Decker, uh, this is a company you are no doubt familiar with the company because they make lots of tools and things that people yeah. use and, um, in the home and um, so on. And um, they took some of their operations, in particular, um, they have um, um, health benefits for their workers. So, um, as, as as many as with many U.S. companies, they offer their workers certain health benefits. Yeah. And 
part of the um, human resources division of Black and Decker um, was um, actually organizing this, was actually implementing this. And, um, you know, they didn't provide the medical services themselves, but they arranged for them. Yeah. And, and they also did it, by the way, not just for um, current workers, but also former workers, retirees. Right. Big part. So they had this whole um, in-house operation to administer um, health benefits. Yeah. Now, at some point, they decided that it would be a good idea to spin this operation out of the company and create a new entity mm -hmm. and put the healthcare administration in that. So they did that. Okay. Yeah. Now, it turns out that and this is a, a peculiarity of the US tax law at the time, mm -hmm. such that they got a, a huge tax benefit from doing this. Okay. Um, but in order to qualify it, they had to show there was a business purpose. And that is usually taken to mean there's some efficiency reason for creating this new entity. Yeah. And they argued that indeed there was because um, it was very important to keep down costs and that it would be, they would be better able to do this in the new entity because um, the people working in the new entity would be on um, incentive schemes, which would give them some um, incentive to reduce costs. Okay? Yeah. But this is how things were going to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now, it turned out, by the way, that the, the people um, working in the new entity were exactly the same people as we're working previously. So yeah. it wasn't like anybody new was brought in really. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm being a bit, I'm simplifying a bit, but essentially it was like as if you, what well, one day you were Black and Decker employees and now I suddenly announced you are going to be working for a different organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, you're gonna be do, doing the same job as before, but right. now you're on some sort of incentive scheme where you get rewarded if you can manage to reduce costs. Mm -hmm. okay. Now. Okay, this is a long, we're now coming to the crunch, the, the punchline, which is that this new entity was set up in such a way that Black and Decker had complete control of it. Okay. In other words, they, uh, they had what I would call residual control rights. They had the ability, so they put in place uh, a management team of this entity, but they retained the ability to fire them at a moment's notice okay yeah so it's like you guys were head of a division before mm -hmm. inside black and decker you were just employees now you are let, let's say one of you is the ceo of this new enterprise mm -hmm. but the the black and decker chief executive can fire you yeah at a moment's notice just as he could when you were division heads yeah okay. so my argument was there was no change of control. The only thing that had happened was that you'd been put on a new incentive scheme. Yeah. But what I said is you could have done that. Black & Decker could have put you on a new incentive scheme. Within their company. Within the company. Yeah. And of course, if they'd done, they would have got exactly the same efficiency benefit, but they yeah. wouldn't have got the tax benefit. Yeah. And so I argued, well, there was no efficiency reason for doing it the way they did it. Yeah. The only reason they were doing that was to get the tax benefit. So that essentially that was my argument and it was based on my work. And with, I won't bore you with the Wells Fargo thing. It was very similar. Okay. Um, but let me just say that in one case, actually we, um, the Black and Decker case was, was settled, but the Wells Fargo case actually went to court and we won. Yeah. My side. I was on the government side. I was on the, so the government was arguing that this was a sham basically. Yeah. So you shouldn't get the tax benefit. And I, I was on their side and we prevailed in at least one, in one of the cases. Yeah. It so, has to do with the boundaries of the, so let me just complete the, uh, the point yeah. that my theoretic work is all about how, um, what defines a firm is who has residual control rights over it. So mm -hmm. that if you have two firms, which uh, they call themselves different things, but the same person owns them both or has control of them both, then they're really one firm. Yeah. So um, where did your interest in economics spark from? Because I know that led to you to get into these cases and even be a professor. Yeah. Uh, where do, 
Well, I it my uh, it was it like any person or like did you have a role model who you looked up to when you did all your economic works? Oh, you mean once I started? Yeah, yeah. Not you don't mean why I got into it, but look. yeah, that was the mathematics. Yes, I mean, I, let me just say the other reason I got into. I mean, I was attracted to it because I was looking. Um, for a way to apply mathemat my, ma my mathematical knowledge. That yeah. was and, but the second thing which I haven't mentioned, but it was worth mentioning, is that I, I like to argue about politics with people. <laughs> yeah. They would always, um, I'm, I'm naturally an argumentative person, but I knew no, they, they would always, always bring in some economic argument, and I lost at that point because I didn't know anything. About economics. So what, another motivation for studying economics was I thought it would help me <laughs> with, with yeah. arguments. Uh, yeah. So anyway, in terms of role models, I mean, um, you know, I, two people, who, well, um, when I was at Warwick, um, one of the professors there, uh, John Williamson, was very helpful to me. Um, he wasn't really working in the same area as me, but mm -hmm. he um, he seemed like, you know, he was someone who knew, uh, had a connection with America, and I, so he'd been a graduate, so he got his PhD from Princeton, and he actually really got me into Princeton. Yeah. And so uh, he was certainly very helpful. Um, the other person, uh, perhaps um, most important as a role model, was uh, Michael Rothschild, who was my advisor at um, Princeton, and yeah. was uh, an economic theorist. Uh, he's very well known for his work on asymmetric information and that, that was just happening at the time that I was a student and so I, I, I would say that had a, a big impact. Yeah. So we originally met you at the Nobel Laureates UBS event in April. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we had the chance to see four Nobel Prize winners including yourself. So how often do you connect with your fellow econom um, economists mm -hmm. and what exactly do you professors talk about um, since you remember Professor Sargent was pretty <laughs> interested in the NBA that night, so we assume it's not all economics. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't. We we don't uh, <laughs> we don't talk to each other every day. Um, it's um, that was a very nice occasion actually because um, I knew uh, you know I've known Angus Deaton for years mm -hmm. um, because we were actually even overlapped at Cambridge briefly. Mm -hmm. um, um, Jim Heckman and Tom Sargent, I know much less well, um, and um, so it's it's extremely nice to get to know some of these people. Um, yeah. They also last summer I was in a, at an event at Lindau. I don't know whether you know about this, but every three years or so, Lindau is a place in Germany mm -hmm. where they have a summer. They have workshops. Yeah. different um, Nobel fields. Um, every summer they have something different or maybe a couple of things each summer. Yeah. And so economics is about every three years. And when they have one, it, it's, it's um, uh, about half, uh, how many days, three or four days, something like that. And they have, um, they invite all the living laureates to come. Yeah. And, they, and there were about 400 young economists you have to apply to to come there and the, yeah. these are graduate students and some young faculty and you're all meant to you know talk to each other and it's very intense and <laughs> actually <laughs> um, quite exhausting but one of the nice things about it is that you get to see laureates in your own field some of whom you do know some of whom you barely know yeah um, uh, maybe you don't know at all um, so there are occasions I have in my own department here, there are two other uh, laureates, uh, mm -hmm. Eric Maskin and Amortia Sen. Right. And, um, I, I don't see Amortia Sen very often, but I see Eric quite often. Um, Bengt Holmstrom, uh, who I won with, is just yeah. down the road at MIT. Um, he spends quite a lot of time in Europe. Uh, and the thing is, people do tend to travel quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and there are many opportunities to travel, but I, I see a lot of him. Um, 
Oh. Those are probably the main ones. Yeah, it's it's not. We certainly just don't, don't just talk about economics. Yeah. <laughs> or if we do, it's economics applied to all sorts of things. You know, which mm -hmm. economics is good for because actually it applies to. Do you guys get into like really heated every debates? aspect of life? You know. Yeah. Do you guys ever get into like really heated debates about your different fields and like different opinions and stuff? Um. It's a good question. I think. Um, It could happen. I I think, you know, to be honest, by the time, you know, if you're lucky enough to win this thing, you, <laughs> tend, to, you tend to become a bit mellow. Yeah. And so some of the sharp uh, elbows, the competitive <laughs> <laughs> instincts which drove you to it, uh, you know, they, they, they're a little um, submerged at this point. And so um, I think people uh, tend to be nice to each other. Um, yeah. But of course, one I could imagine political disagreements mm -hmm. um, because, after all, we live in a time when um, there are a lot of disagreements. But um, yeah. I think, um, I mean, how many laureates in economics are Trump supporters? Yeah, uh, I think probably I, I was told at least one. I'm not going to say who it was, but it's not me. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, if, if, uh, if that came up, I could imagine things okay. getting a bit heated. But uh, by and large, I think people try to steer. They probably know what the, the danger yeah. points are. Uh, but you, you were there at the UBS thing. Um, yeah. We had, I mean, Jim Heckman, for example, is a Chicago economist. But yeah. I didn't find myself disagreeing with him much at, at all. He seemed like a very reasonable guy to me. Right. Um, I think he wants to improve the world. I want to improve the world. We may have somewhat different ways of doing it, but you know, on, we have a similar um, goal. Yeah. Yeah, end goal. So. Um, how would you say your life has differed from working in universities and colleges rather than at companies? Because I know at universities and colleges, you're probably exposed to more liberal points of views, uh, more left people apply there like that. Oh, well, uh, by the way, I mean, I've never worked in a company, so I don't know what that's like. Um, okay. But I'm sure the work is very different. That's not what you mean. I mean, the work as an academic, um, you have a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. which is great. On the other hand, it can be quite lonely. Right. Um, this is something people don't quite... I mean, if you're working in a business, in a company, I think um, one of the things is you're more likely to be in a team and you know assuming assuming it's a reasonably you know you get on with people roughly um that can be um very fulfilling i i've had some experiences of that yeah um you know i'm uh, currently working on a, on, on the le on these legal cases where i work you know I, the, the, we've mentioned two but i also happen to be uh, involved in one at the moment i can't speak about it but yeah mm -hmm. that becomes um, there are lots of people involved in that. I get help from lots of people. It's very much a team effort. Yeah. I can see the, uh, there's a, there are big attractions from that because you don't um, come home at the end of the day thinking I did nothing and it's all my ideas are useless and so on, which, you know, one does feel a lot of the time. So yeah. um, in terms of the politics, though, I would say that... Um, you know, economists, there's a whole mix of views. They're not, some, they're liberal people and they're also conservatives. I have right. some conservatives in my department. So um, Republicans, at least, I don't know what they call them. You know, now they're in a rather difficult situation. You know, what is the Republican Party anymore? But yeah. let's say traditionally they were, some of them. Um, and so I'm, I'm and, and economics in a way is quite a, conser it's conservative in certain ways because it, um, as an economist, you learn to um, respect the market. You learn yeah. to respect what people can achieve by themselves through contracting. Um, you learn to be skeptical about the role of government. It's not that you don't realize that government's very important, but you don't think that government is the solution to all the problems. Yeah, the things people can do better by themselves, and then some things the government. Yeah, like private companies and stuff. Yeah, so I think naturally economists are not exactly. You know, they are already quite conservative in certain respects. 
not yeah. in terms of social things, but in terms of other things. So I, I think the kind of thing, you know, people are always complaining about universities being so liberal. It's much less true uh, in a field like economics. Right. So um, looking back, you can see that you've done like a, a lot with your life, probably a lot more than we could, probably, we could ever do. Um, would you say you have fulfilled and surpassed your lifelong goal and dream? And if so, at what point in your life was that? Um, you know, I didn't have any particular ambition. I, I, I mean, I sort of took it one step at a time. I, I didn't, uh, I, I would never, you know, I would never have thought I would win the Nobel Prize when I was mm -hmm. starting out. It wasn't a yeah. goal. It never occurred to me. Um, obviously, you know, that is something which exceeds anything I could really have imagined. However, um, although that's wonderful, and I'm deeply grateful for having been awarded it, um, ultimately, um, in terms of my professional life, there's also, of course, of course, my personal life, so, you know, and my yeah. uh, family, uh, which is very important to me and uh, where I feel good about things. But um, in terms of um, professional goals, I think I'm... Um, you know, more concerned not about awards, but about whether I think um, the work is really insightful. Right. Whether it really, uh, you know, have I um, actually added value? Mm -hmm. are my, how good are my, how are my ideas really? And about this, I are, I have many doubts uh, to this day. So, um, and actually, the Nobel Prize itself. Um, is a little bit of a mixed blessing because, um, I mean, only a little bit, but um, you speak a lot about your work. Yeah. Um, and other people speak about it. And to the extent, you know, you can also, as well as it's very nice when people praise it, but you also see all the weaknesses. Yeah. And in the case of, of, of my area of, of incomplete contracts, there's much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not at all satisfied with where we are. And indeed, I'm still working on the topic. Yeah, uh, because and, and and the reason I'm working on it is there's much more to be done. So I'm not done yet, and I'll only know whether I feel good enough, good about what I've achieved there. You know, in, in uh, I'm not ready. Yet, you know, in a few years, yeah, come back and ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, motivated individual individuals like yourself are always pursuing the next big thing. So, and that's a concept that kind of crosses all fields and industries. So I'm just supposing your next big thing is just kind of finding the revelation on these economic um, like contracts. And how much data do you actually need to like make sure you're at the point where you can really be happy with your work where it is? Data. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, I'm, I'm developing theories, but the theories have to... Um, as a theorist in this kind of area, which is a real world area. So it's yeah. not uh, ivory tower, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's not very, it's not abstract. Yeah. It's not concrete, but it's still theory, which is in itself abstract. So uh, in order to succeed, you, um, the, um, the hurdle is actually quite high because on the one hand, you have to satisfy your fellow theorists who have, certain theoretical standards. So uh, yeah. when you develop a theory in economics, it, uh, which involves models, this is what we do, um, they have to meet certain criteria, um, which by the way, you can't really write down, you, you know, what they are, but you kind of know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. So there's a group of theorists who have to say, yeah, that's good, we like that, that's above the line, if you like. Um, but then it also has to be um, to say something about the world to the point where more practically minded people will say, yeah, I think I, I learned something from that. Yeah. As opposed to, wow, well, that could be true, but I've never seen anything like that before, you know. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm, and I'm in the happy position of working with a real lawyer. So this actually was one of the benefits of the whole Nobel experience. Yeah. Uh, when I went, so the, a few 
you win the prize, you go, you'll get invited to Sweden for this Nobel week. It's a week, there's a week long series of events, which is quite amazing actually. But among other things, you're invited to various places during that week. Yeah. And you can't do everything and you get too many invitations. But one thing I did was to go to a law firm in Stockholm uh, and the person who invited me there is someone who works on contracts and he was kind of interested in my work and particularly my more recent work and we are working together now mm -hmm. on something and and the great benefit th of this is that um, he has a very analytical mind himself he's not a an academic but yeah. he has a kind of academic approach to life as well as being a practitioner so he together you know he can tell me what he thinks the big questions are and I can tell him what the way I think about it and with luck we're going to converge on something right we'll actually speak to both audiences so this is what I'm doing right now and um, I'm sort of uh, cautiously well I'm hoping it'll turn into something yeah so um, we always end the interview off on the same question what advice would you give to the next generation of high schoolers who are aspiring to be the next generation of Nobel Prize winners and leaders of our world that will make the um, world a better place to live in? Uh, that's a very, very easy. Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> Good answer to that. I would say, first of all, um, I mean, I'm going to say things which are kind of rather obvious, a bit, bit trite, but... Um, you know, I think you should pursue your interests. There's no point. There's no point thinking about how do I win a Nobel Prize. That's yeah. the wrong way to think about it. You should try to do something interesting or significant. Mm -hmm. or, and if it works out and people love it, well, that's great. But yeah. it shouldn't be your your goal. Um, I would say um, one of the things uh, which worries me, you know, when you re you hear about young people, and you can tell me, you know, you must have a view about this, but, uh, you know, one hears, um, um, you know, I, I now have grandchildren, one of whom uh, is 11, mm -hmm. nearly 12, and the other one is nearly eight. So younger than you, but not incredibly much so. Yeah. Um, and they... Um, what one hears about kids today is that they they want um, very quick answers to things that they don't have much patience. Yeah. Um, and this worries me a bit because I think that of all the things I would say I have actually as a characteristic which has helped me, it's patience and persistence. Uh, that is, I have been willing to spend a lot of time um, trying to crack some problem, and it seems to me that to be a top academic, you have to do that. If I think of yeah. mathematics, um, you know, which as I say, I wasn't gonna ever be good enough at that, but you take someone like Andrew Wiles, if you know who he is, who uh, proved Fermat's last theorem and took years, he just worked away by himself. Um, nobody knew what he was doing. Um, he didn't tell people really what he was doing, but several years, he was just working by himself and he finally did it. Um, okay. This is the kind of thing I think it, it takes that. And that means you have to be patient and yeah. not always be asking. So, so I think um, that's, um, so I think, you know, be, work hard, try to um, figure out what you're interested in, what you think you can do, uh, use, you know, you, you can do well that you are interested in. Don't be too uh, influenced by um, what's currently popular. This is very hard. Yeah. Lots of people uh, will migrate to whatever everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you're, you're happier that way, but it may not produce the best results. The best results may be produced if you just uh, follow your own route, your own path, you know? But then you have to be rather strong, um, thick-skinned and strong-willed to do that. So these are things that are important um and and of course you should be uh if you you know try to make the world a better place you need to uh, um believe in the important you know important principles of uh, um, everybody's important and uh um, yeah we should be nice i mean so very different from the way our president <laughs> <laughs> thinks I can't resist saying that I mean, <laughs> um, I have a, not a good I, role model no, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I have a um, quick question so 
Uh, how often do you travel and how often do you meet um, Professor Ben Holstrom? Oh, uh, well, I travel quite a bit. Um, it all depends. I haven't been, tra you know, I went to China a couple of times mm -hmm. in March and May. I went to Italy. Um, last year I was traveling a lot. It, it varies. But I, um, I also like it when I'm not traveling. But Bengt um, Holmstrom, you know, he's um, most of the year he's just down the road. Yeah. So I, you know, I see him. I don't see him all the time. Maybe once every two or three months. Yeah. We'll get together, have lunch. Wow. How closely do you coordinate with um, with Mr. Holstrom or Professor Holstrom uh, when you're doing your contract theory work? Well, we 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 collaborated twice. Okay. But we do different kind. Um, but in general, we don't work, you know, most of our work hasn't been together. Yeah. Supplementary. He, he works on uh, what I would call more complete contracts, and I'm in complete contracts. So he's more, his work is more about incentive schemes, or right. how to incent, not just incentive schemes, but how to design um, uh, work so that people are motivated uh, appropriately, whereas I'm more uh, talking about allocation of decision rights. 